Namaskar to Indoor. Normally, my talk is 80% Hindi, Baki Tuta Futa English. But today we have got overseas speakers, so I have to respect them, so it'll be in English. So the best person to talk about semaglutide would be an overweight person. So I am best suited to speak on it. So now we'll go to the medical. This is not my case, not my patient. So few things first. What happens in a diabetes conference is we straight away look at the HB1C. I have changed my practice, and I tell my juniors to do the same. When a patient with diabetes comes, blood sugar report is here, sir. No, I will not look at that. Look at lifestyle, smoking. Second. I will look at LDL cholesterol. Third, I will look at blood pressure. Then weight. Last will be blood sugar. Because what happens is, first blood sugar, all energy, conversation, 90% gone there, 10% less left for this. So patient gets the impression that those are perhaps not that important. Blood sugar is the most important. Whereas those are probably more important than blood sugar. So first here, LDL 103 is not a target. So that should needs to be um, addressed. Blood pressure on the higher side as well. Third, then BMI is 30. So these things to be addressed first. Then I will come to the HB1C. Now, he has got strong family history of um, ischemic uh, heart disease. He's got a sedentary job like myself. Often, he, often eats sugary snacks like myself. So I like to think that this is my flight. I'm not diabetic yet, by the way. Now, so this person, our, what do we normally do? We diagnose, we start on metformin and diet and exercise. Whereas we need multifactorial treatment right from day one to prevent the complication, but that doesn't happen. So what happens to this gen gentleman? After, in the past three years, his sedentary lifestyle has re made, uh, remained the same. He's getting hypoglycemic episodes. Now, if you look there, metformin is one gram twice a day, and glimepiride is near full dose of four milligram. So near full dose of your know, sulfonuria, his HB1C is still not at target, and he's getting hypoglycemic episodes. So at three years, his HB1C has gone up, which is a bit surprising. I thought it will go up even more. His BMI has stayed up. Blood pressure has gone up. Now he's developing albuminuria. If you look at the ADA guideline, so two or more risk factors, then you have to consider as GLT-2 or GLP-1. So I, I, that's mnemonic which I put is SHODA. S, smoking, H for hyperlipidemia, O for obesity, uh, D for dyslipidemia, and A for albuminuria. Sorry, H for hypertension, A for albuminuria. So he has got a few of them, okay, already. So he is obese, he's got albuminuria. Now, treatment decision to start multifactorial treatment started here at 8.3, here. So three years have gone. We missed three years. So if you look at comparison of oral CIMA, now I will criticize my own slides as well, with SGLT2. So there's one head-to-head -head trial of semaglutide versus empagliflozin. And I think I'm a little bit uncomfortable with blanket statements like, so oral semaglutide is much superior than empagliflozin as far as weight loss is, con uh, is concerned. No, not really. If you look, the data at 26 weeks was statistically not significant. It was at week 52 in the trial product as demand. That means only those who are receiving the drug. You know, in those only, at 52 weeks, there was some weight loss more than empagliflozin. Making a blanket statement, it all throughout there is weight loss more than empagliflozin, perhaps incorrect. And I always encourage, why do you want to compete with empagliflozin? This is what I tell all the GLP-1 companies. It is in addition to GLP-1. GL SGLT-2 has become cheaper now. So this is in addition to SGLT-2. That is what we must consider, not compete with it. Now, the HB1C, however, oral semaglutide versus EMPA, Oral semaglutide is clearly better. There is no question, even at week 26, even at week 52. So weight loss of more than 5%, again, week 52, there was not statistical difference, but at week 26, 
there was statistical difference in weight loss of more than 5%. You know that more than 5% makes metabolic sense. So if you lose more than 5%, you will get the metabolic benefits. So the other important thing, if you look, there is 45% greater reduction in waist circumference. And we know that waist circumference equates to higher risk of cardiovascular diseases. So that is there as compared to empagliflozin. So for uh, this gentleman, thankfully, statin was started and GLP-1 was initiated, and that resulted in a nice drop of HbA1c to 6.8. Again, I will look at the LDL first. The LDL has come down to 92. Now, blood pressure has come down. Now, you see here, we think that SGLT2 reduces the blood pressure, but we fail to appreciate that the GLP-1 receptors are also very good at reducing the blood pressure. In the head-to-head -head trial of oral semaglutide versus empagliflozin, there was a similar reduction of blood pressure, and that is, <clears throat> that is very important to note. So his blood pressure has also come down, because with 140 over 86, if you tell the patient, we will start you on blood pressure tablets. He will say, don't start it now. Because my daughter's marriage was there. My son's exam was there. There was demonetization. So don't start now. I'm very stressed. So I've seen my um, prescriptions. Four, three, four years have gone up by. Blood pressure is staying like that. If you say, I'm going to add one blood pressure tablet. Oh, you're going to start for life. So this, we are killing two birds in one stone. We're getting the blood pressure down as well. We're not using it as an antihypertensive tablet. But this is one of the pleiotropic benefits we get with both SGLT2 and GLP-1 receptor agonists. So here, instead of waiting for the person to develop complications and then start effective drugs, we need to start straight away early treatment, multifactorial treatment to prevent the complications. That is to be thought of. So multifactorial treatment is not only anti-diabetic drugs, but also lipid drugs, looking at the blood pressure, taking care of the weight. So the physician's guide as to how do I take the oral semaglutide tablet, a few con areas of confusion which I would like to clear. So this is one uh, troublesome thing, taking the stomach um, tablet on an empty stomach. And you know, I'm from Calcutta, and the Bengalis don't get up from bed without a cup of tea. Very, very difficult to convince them that you should have this. And then some of my patients said, can I have this and go back to sleep? I said, yes, you wake up at 6 o'clock, take it, go back to sleep, wake up at 6.30, then you have your tea. So swallowing it with half glass of water, 120 ml, if you take more or if you take less, the PKPD data varies. So 120 ml, half a glass. Do not break, crush, or chew the tablet. So the other thing is, so once I prescribe 14 milligrams for a patient. Patient said, I've got a lot of seven milligram tablets, so I'll take two of them. Is that okay? No, 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 that is not okay. Why not? I will tell you. So the semaglutide, the snack in the semaglutide, so that's about 300 milligrams. That is the optimal concentration for semaglutide absorption. If you have less of snack, or more of snack. Snack is S-N-A-C, not S-N-A-C-K. Snack is the agent which improves the absorption. So if you have double of the snack, so if we take seven milligram, two tablets together, you're giving 600 milligrams of snack. That will affect the absorption. So you cannot take double dose, you cannot take half dose, you have to take the full tablet. So seven milligram, full tablet, 14 milligram, full tablet. So what are the other factors? Taking food, you should be fasting for about six to eight hours. Um, water, 120 ml, and fasting for 30 minutes. If you fast for 15 minutes, if you fast for 60 minutes, then the absorption is a bit different. So the HB1C drop, and this is the PRP, I think, of semaglutide. As I said, even with the head-to-head -head com um, comparison with empagliflozin, it is clearly better head-to-head -head comparison with 1.8 milligrams liraglutide, it is better, both HB1C and weight. 
So if you look at the baseline, always look at any trial, anybody telling you this was the percentage of HbA1c drop. What was the baseline HbA1c? So if you look here, with baseline HbA1c of 8%, but 1.5%, more than 9%, you get 2.5%. That's relevant, because most of the time we end up giving it to 9%. So we'll get 2.5%. So many a time, suppose somebody comes with an HbA1c of 9%, you know, adding SGLT2 won't get it down by more than 0.7 or 0.8. Neither with DPP4 inhibitors. One drug won't achieve it. But here, one drug can achieve about 2.5% drop in HbA1c. And of course, if you are overweight, you get much bigger drop of your weight. So patients, uh, HbA1c less than 6.5% 6, 6 plus weight loss of more than 5%. HbA1c less than 6.5 plus body weight loss more than 5%, you get about 40% of the patients achieve that. And in the various pioneer studies, if you compare with mpar in here, so achieving 1% drop in HbA1c, more than 1% drop in HbA1c plus 5% weight reduction, you get in comparison with mpar liraglutide, sitagliptin, everything else, you get multiple times more benefit with the oral semaglutide. So this probably summarizes everything. You get at least 1.5% drop in HbA1c. You get a weight loss of 5 kilograms. Often understated, you get a systolic blood pressure drop of 5 millimeters. Each millimeter blood pressure drop helps. Each millimeter. And there is some beneficial effect, although it is not salutary, the beneficial effect, Oral semaglutide also reduces the HCRP. You get weight circumference uh, reduction as well. So diabetes patients are on multiple other drugs. Will that affect um, if I take oral semaglutide? So here it shows, I think, two areas which stand out. One is the warfarin here, and the other is um, thyroid. So my, not majority, small minority of the patients are on warfarin. If they're warfarin, you have to check the INR more frequently. Thyroid is a problem. It is a problem because it is taken in empty stomach. If you see, if you take a um, thyroid tablet in empty stomach, the absorption is about 80%. If you take thyroid tablet in a full stomach, the absorption is 60%. So sometimes I tell my patients, if you forget to take your thyroid tablet, either next day you take both the tablets together or the same day you take it whenever you, you can. At least 60% will be absorbed. But the semaglutide absorption is much lower. So with the thyroid tablet, you cannot take it with the semaglutide. So what to do? So options are you take the semaglutide tablet. Half an, after half an hour, um, you take... Um, uh, the thyroid tablet, after one hour, you have your food. If I do that, I'll have to change my practice from Kolkata and start practicing in Indoor because people will drive me out of there. We are not able to take our tea, tea also. If you look at Davidson's textbook of medicine, there, the thyroid tablet is advised to be taken at bedtime. Why? Because in the Western world, they take their dinner at 7 p.m. We go to sleep at 11 p.m., you get four-hour gap. We need to have four-hour gap, casting emptying time, four-hour gap for the thyroid tablet to be taken safely. So therefore, I ask my patients when they're taking oral semaglutide, I said, you can't take the thyroid tablet in the morning. When can I take? I said, what, which one is your largest gap between meals? And many of them say, I have my lunch around 1, 1.30. Then I come back home around 6 o'clock, I have snacks. Okay, so here is the opportunity. You have got about five-hour gap here before having your evening snack, one hour before or half an hour before you take the thyroid tablet. So there's a four hour gap between your meal, okay? So that's the way I do it. So I think um, this I've uh, explained. So um, levothyroxine, and I've told you about um, the INR as well. But majority of them, including PPIs, one of the commonest drugs, they don't seem to interact. Uh, with the oral semaglutide. It's the warfarin, uh, which is clinically relevant, and of course, thyroid, which is clinically relevant. So one of the commonly asked questions, doctor, this is very costly. This is a very costly drug. 
why are you giving me a costly drug? So the answer is that I, I tell them that you look at it as a fixed deposit. You will get the return later on. Do you have any uh, money in the fixed deposit or in your savings or some yes, yes. Why do you have it? Use the money right now. Do you keep it because you want to have a healthy financial balance after five, 10 years? Look at it with fixed deposit angle. So in India, I think the cost of diabetes complications, you know, here is 1.8 times higher for complicated non-hospitalized patients. For hospitalized patients is 2.4 times higher. And 48% more cost of care in people with more than three comorbidities. So indirect cost accounts for more than 50% of the direct cost. So look at it from a longer, don't look at it with a myopic viewpoint, look at it the longer viewpoint is what is going to happen after five, 10 years. So this is it, so at incremental cost, this is the cost uh, with good control with say oral semaglutide cost. So initially the cost will be higher, but as time goes by, if you do not control your blood sugar well, do not control your blood pressure, lipid profile, then the cost goes up. That's the indirect cost which goes up. So you're saving, if, and so I tell my patient, this is the gap, this is what we're saving in the future. So the higher HB1C, because the HB1C is very important. Patients come to you to lower the blood sugar. It's very difficult to convince them what is going to happen after 10 years. They come to you for lowering blood sugar. So this is very important. Why? Because if you look at fatal, non-fatal, MI, stroke, amputation, heart failure, everywhere, higher the HB1C, higher is the incidence. We have to lower the blood sugar level. And 1% drop in HB1C is associated with this much drop in various diabetes, both macro and microvascular complications, more of the microvascular complications rather than the macro. So I think this is my brief um, summary introduction, whatever you might say, of semaglutide and the practical way as to how I go about. Thank you very much.